What you are seeing is a particular cultural moment near the dawn of the 20th century, when the urgency to create an eroticized femme fatale completely overwhelmed all desire to tell a real or a balanced story of Judith or Circe or Salome. And just who is Circe, asked John Milton in his 1637 Mosque Comus. She is the daughter of the sun whose charmed cup whoever tasted lost his upright shape and downward fell into a groveling swine. There's so much more to Circe's story than transforming men to groveling pigs, yet prior to classics scholar Madeline Miller's stunning act of reclamation giving us a Circe whose whole life, instead of just a snapshot and icon, comes alive, our generation knew a Circe Homer or Hesiod or Virgil would barely recognize for the converter of men to swine became denatured and reshaped into symbol and icon as she passed through the Circe obsessed symbolist decadent and fantasical culture of the 1890s and we over a century later are still living in the aftermath those images of dominatrix Circe or enchantress Circe, but they're really about the desires or the imagined desires of the viewers, not so much about Circe herself. And as to all this fun groveling before an elevated Circe, riding crop in hand, towering above you on a throne or dais or altar, what does Circe through the mouth of Miller say? I had no altar, but I didn't need one. Anywhere I was became my temple. This is my single favorite phrase from any novel I've read this year. Anywhere I was became my temple. Miller's Circe has emotional depth, sharp intellect, and keen self-awareness. She's busy, resourceful, adaptive, and sometimes fun. Perhaps the single most fit partner for Ulysses in all the world and when he finally departs, is self-reliant and reflective as Thoreau at Walden Pond. This painting by the pre-Raphaelite Edward Burns Jones is among the hundreds of paintings of Circe, perhaps the most reflective of both Circe's life and her nature, and I love it. Circe is the daughter of Helios, surrounds herself with sunflowers as if reclaiming and honoring her childhood, her ancestry, her family. The panthers are so muscled, fierce, and beautifully wild in their energy, but utterly devoted to Circe. And though they once were men, they seem at home and quite happy in their devotional lot. And Circe, having created quite a world for herself in her Island exile looks driven and self-possessed and purposeful. Look outward at the vast, illimitable sea, and you can't help but be a bit awed by the sheer depths of the painting, the incoming ships bearing those who will be turned to swine, then turned back to men, and also bearing Odysseus, who will become Circe's lover. 
Dante Gabriel Rossetti was so moved by what he saw as the dual nature of the painting perfectly reflecting the inner complexities of Circe, he went home and wrote a sonnet about the painting. In it, he emphasizes the black drops of Circe's Hecate like elixir matching the beauty of the panthers and the oranges of sweetness and life, speaking of Circe's dual nature of sunshine, sunflowers, and life, and a Hecateing darkness. The Wine of Circe, Edward Byrne Jones, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Dusk haired and gold robed over the golden wine she stoops wherein distilled of death and shame sink the black drops while lit with fragrant flame round her spread board the golden sunflowers shine doth helios here with hecate combine o circe thou their votress to proclaim for these thy guests all rapture in love's name, till piteous night give day the countersign. Here are two other Circe paintings I find quite lovely. One is George Romney's portrait of Emma Hart as Circe. She is dynamic and rounded and forceful and smart. She seems fascinating. The other is one of several Circe paintings by John William Waterhouse, Circe here is reflective, committed to studying her sorcery hard. You can blink and see her at Starbucks poring over her studies with the sense her diligence might just change the world. So the question becomes, how did we get from this world of Circe to this one or this? Let's begin at a seemingly unlikely place in the 1870 novel by the Austrian author Leopold von Sacher Massach about a man named Severn who craves to be worshipful and submissive slave of Wanda von Donaju and finds over time he craves being treated in ever more degrading ways and takes great pleasure in being her swine. Now if you think that's an unlikely pairing, try to keep representations of Venus and furs and representations of Circe straight in your mind. It's harder than you think. Okay, first is a painting of Circe. Next is a photograph of Sacher von Massach staging a scene from Venus and Furs. Then is Willy Pagoni Circe and Rops Circe. And without the title, could you really tell whether this is Circe or Venus and Furs? Now the woman on the throne or altar with the pig crop, that's the first Circe painting by John William Waterhouse. And then you have two different editions of Venus and Furs, but the painting illustrating the second book isn't Venus and Furs at all. It's Gustav Klimt's Judith, the slayer of General Holofernes. You can tell by the head she is holding. Well, actually you can't tell by the head because the two other femme fatales that share the stage with Circe are Judith and Salome. And remember, they both cut off heads. But that was Judith, and this is Salome. Which brings us back to where we began, which is with the three primary femme fatales of the decadent, symbolist, and fin de siècle 1890s, Judith, Salome, and Circe. Is this all Sacker Massacs? doing? Not at all. By 1890, what in 1870 had seemed transgressive and would have been kept behind the counter was largely normalized within the culture. There was a widespread fascination with the edges of erotics. Decadence was everywhere in the poems of Swinburne, the writings of Oscar Wilde, the illustrations of Beardsley. Symbolism, tried to give voice to dreams and to the unconscious, and both those worlds, as we know, are uncensored and wildly expressive without restraints. Both the words decadence and symbolism were first used to describe the 1890s by the poet and essayist Arthur Simmons, and of course Simmons wrote a Circe poem. It isn't very good, but it sure touches all the major themes of symbolism and decadence. 
Circe, the wine of Circe, sorceress, I have lived, but can your magic bid me die? I would die exquisitely of the bliss of one intense, intolerable kiss. You lean above me and strain me pantingly close against your breasts, lips reddening to the rose of fire, breasts engulfing me into oblivion. Let me drain Circe, the wine of Circe, the rose of fire that descends and bends from the night of heaven to my desire. Your lips burn a living fire through veins that yearn one throb of rapt, surrendering breath dies into the ecstasy of death. Well, all the themes of decadence are in Simmons' Circe poem, embracing the night, the night's transgressions, embracing a dreamy tumble towards erotic extremes, the merging of erotic rapture and death and worshipping a woman where the red of his lips become the red of blood and embracing the engulfing flood of oblivion. But where, where is Circe in all of this? She did turn some humans into animals, but read Miller's book so that begins to make exquisite sense or pick up a 1921 volume of poems called Hymen by the extraordinary poet Hilda Doolittle and read these lines in her poem Circe. Circe by H.D. It was easy enough to bend them to my wish. It was easy enough to alter them with a touch. But you, adrift on the great sea, how shall I call you back? Cedar and white ash, rock cedar and sand plants, and tamarind, red cedar and white cedar and black cedar from the inmost forest, fragrance upon fragrance, and all my sea magic is for naught. It was easy enough, a thought called them from the sharp edges of the earth. They prayed for a touch. They cried for the sight of my face. They entreated me till in pity I turned each to his own self. Panther and panther, then a black leopard follows close, black panther and red, and a great hound, a godlike beast cut in the sand in a clear ring and shot me from the earth and cover the sea sound with their throats and the sea roar with their own barks and bellowing and snarls and the sea stars and the swirl of the sand in the rock tamarinds and the wind resonance but not your voice it is easy to call men from the edges of the earth. It is easy to summon them to my feet with a thought. It is beautiful to see the tall panther and the sleek deer hounds circle in the dark. It is easy enough to make cedar and white ash fumes into palaces and to cover the sea caves with ivory and onyx. But I would give up rock fringes of coral and the inmost chamber of my island palace and my own gifts and the whole region of my power and magic for your glance. I love Hilda Doolittle's 1921 Circe poem. Thank you for watching this. I will continue to make videos on mythology, literature, painting, and cultural history. If you liked this, please subscribe. If you missed the last video, it was on the fascination of painters with Danae and her impregnation by Zeus in a shower of gold. Yes, the shower is fascinating, but also suggested if you really want to understand what's going on, watch the faces.